the breath. I can just say meditation, but a lot of people will say, yeah, meditation's hard. I can't make my mind go blank. And I'm like, yo, that's not even what we're talking about. We don't want to make, a <laughs> we don't want to make our mind go blank. Rather, let's give your mind an anchor, give your mind something to focus on. Instead of thinking meditation is making your mind go blank and all of a sudden magically transcending in, with some being of light or something, forget, forget all that. Let's make it practical and real world. Close your eyes for a second. So you shut off your, one of your sense windows to the outside world. So I would ask students to just do that at first. Let's get a little taste of this. So just close your, and you can do it right now if you'd like, and your listeners can do it right now. Just close your eyes. So you're already started to uproot your awareness from the physical world. And then slowly breathe in through your nose. But while you breathe in through your nose, feel the air inside your nostrils. Like how often do you do that? Now, when you breathe out, can you still feel the air inside your nostrils, like physically? And keep doing that. And then you're immediately brought into something more subtle than advertisements and fancy shoes and getting your car washed. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to MYYT, where you are learning to level up your yoga teaching one masterful class at a time. I just got back from Mississippi. I went to a family reunion for the 4th of July and had an absolute blast, although I am not envious of Mississippi's humidity. Whew, Vegas is hot, but at least it's not hot and wet. I really like the dry heat of it. Feels like you're being cooked in an oven and I'm not mad about it. It was so humid there and poor baby Finn was like, what is this? As he's just sitting and sweating. <laughs> Although it did make his hair really curly, which was so sweet just to see my eight month old baby's hair getting more and more curly like his dad. And everybody was saying, oh my gosh, he is copy paste of Colin. <laughs> And it's so true. He's a literal carbon copy of my husband. And it's so fun just to watch him grow. It's happening so fast. I can't even believe that he's already been on three flights between my Tulum retreat earlier this year, my Canada trip for a tour, and now to Mississippi. So it has been a very busy first six months of the year, and here we are approaching and entering the second six months. So I hope your holiday was safe, that you celebrated with family, and that you feel free in the sense of just how liberated we are from a lot of things. I also just got back from the dentist. Keeping my teeth clean, my grandfather, who actually was a dentist, would be so proud. Um, so it's a nice feeling to feel like you've got some pearly whites, that you're home, that you can dive into the next projects. And speaking of the next projects, I think I've, I've told you all a few times, but to remind you, I'm so excited that Rachaka Retreats, my retreat company, is about to start offering a yoga teacher training program. And we are eagerly awaiting to hear back from the Yoga Alliance about our first draft and submission of our YTT manual. Annual. Any day now, I'm going to hear whether it's immediately approved, approved, or if it needs a couple of revisions, but I can't wait to hear what the status is on that. I've also started to create and craft a group program. It's going to be called Matt to Matt Mastermind. That is my next, the next thing that's on my heart. I've had this idea for years. And so I am in course creation mode, coming up with incredible content that is going to help the yoga teacher who's really looking to master their teaching, master their messaging, master their marketing for more packed out classes. That is what this group program is going to be. I'm planning to march in September and go all the way to uh, December. So about a four month container with that. And let me tell you, as it comes together, I'm looking at it all being like, this is incredible. I can't wait to lead this. I can't wait to be in that space. There's nothing like being in a group mastermind where so many yoga teachers are coming together and sharing their geniuses, sharing what has not worked and sharing what has worked and really learning from one another. And being in that energy and space is one of the fastest ways to really grow. So I'm so excited to keep creating it. Keep your eyes peeled as I am posting more about all of that coming together and some of the freebies to celebrate the launch of it. It's going to be amazing. Today's guest, Paul Benedict, is a dear friend. We chatted 
if you're like out there thinking, I have wanted to lead a yoga workshop before. However, I don't want to do one that's purely based on asana. I don't want to do a workshop around the poses. I really want to do about the practicality of how to make yoga philosophy a little bit more of a roadmap on how to live more of a clear life, or you want to lead a workshop on mindset or something outside the body. This conversation is going to be so beneficial for you. What Paul basically walks us through is how to design and craft a really captivating experience that has nothing to do with the body and all to do with the mind in a way that sets people up with this beautiful roadmap on how to use yogic principles to navigate their life with more grace. We talk about things like theosophy, his process on writing a book, the astounding similarities between authors like Patanjali and Eckhart Tolle, flipping the script on problems, the biggest misunderstandings with meditation. And then the best part is the sample of his clarity workshop where he gives prompts on how to uncover your Dharma code, your Sankalpa, Vikalpa, and departure point. If you want an inside peek on how to craft really incredible experiences without using asana, this one is for you. Turn it up and let's dive in. Benedict practices and teaches various schools of Hatha, Raja, Vinyasa, and Tantra Yoga with an emphasis on pranayama, breathwork, meditation, and yoga philosophy. He offers sound meditation with bowls and gongs, Thai yoga bodywork, and yoga nidra to his clients as additional modalities to support holistic health and longevity at all levels. Paul began practicing yoga in 2001 through the discovery of Raja Yoga, learning meditation, and through his involvement with the Theosophical Society. Paul teaches, gives presentations, and courses on Eastern philosophy, spiritual growth, and the ancient wisdom tradition in Las Vegas, nationally and internationally, and is a staff teacher on multiple 200, 300, and 500 hour training programs. In 2012, he co-wrote the book, Ancient Wisdom for a New Age, a practical guide for spiritual growth. Writing has begun on his second book as well, which is a commentary on the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. Paul's journey through physical yoga began in 2008 through the Anusara and Bikram styles. Paul holds multiple teaching credentials in para yoga, smart flow yoga, the Himalayan Institute, Z Flow Power Yoga, and Devanandi School of Yoga and Wellness. He also studied Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga with Tim Miller. Paul is a proponent of applying new age teachings in his yoga instruction and his real estate business. Paul also writes and records music for guitar and loves hiking, travel, and exploring innovations in science and technology. What does he not do, everybody? I am so excited to have you on the po- on the podcast, Paul. Thank you so much for being here. Mackenzie, this is a, is a true honor. I'm, it's wonderful. Thanks for the invite. Yeah. Seriously, though, I'm, I'm sitting here reading your bio like you list everything. What is it a struggle to be so gifted and talented at so many things? You're hilarious. I look, look who's talking though. I mean, everything I I list there, I'm sure you teach uh, very proficiently in your trainings and in your, in your world of yoga instruction. (laughs) I love it. I love the whole spectrum. Of course I could, you know, name some aspects of the yoga world that I'm not keen on. You want me to do that and start start some drama a little bit? (laughs) I don't dance either. I, I, should, I should put that down. You know, at the Radiance Festival. Yeah. I was about to say, that's not true. I saw you throw it down on the silent Discord, disco dance floor. If, if you consider that dancing, I appreciate you. You're very kind. <laughs> Paul, I'm trying to remember the first time I saw you. I feel like we ended up rolling out our mats next to each other in some class. And I was practicing, kind of minding my own, bu- my own business. I had Pratyahara going on, right? But then I became aware of this incredible human and energy and also the audible like rhythmicity of your breathing. And I was like, who is this person? I need to know this person. (laughs) And then right after the class, I probably walked up to you and was like, 
excuse me. Hi. Hello. My name's Big Hit. Who are you? <laughs> That's amazing to hear you say that. And I thank you. <laughs> my, my breath could be a little bit loud sometimes. Um, it's prominent. It's the, one of the focal points of my entire practice. I wonder if that might have been a Jen Knox guided Ashtanga primary class. It I'm pretty been. sure it was. Yeah. It, it's amazing to practice and breathe with um, other like-minded yogis in a synchronized way. And I, I loved your word, rhythmicity. Yes. Yes. Let's do some rhythmic breathing, add some rhythmicity. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Yeah. You definitely are like a metronome practicing next to you is, pr and I think you actually do that. Maybe I've been to one of your classes where you did actually whip out a metronome and you were like, <laughs> let's, let's try to feel and find this rhythm. And I was like, nice. I'm going to steal that technique sometimes. Most definitely. I, I do use a metronome. That is very true. Yeah. Yeah. No, but I've always had this big respect for you. I, I can see how much you dive into your self-study practices. I've seen the way you show up online and how much you try to educate on some of these more subtler realms of the practice. So I'm just, I don't know. I'm a big fan of you. I really like you, Paul. I'm so glad you're here. Kenzie, I'm a big fan of you too. Teaching that class together in, in the yard was, was one of the biggest honors. Let's do that again. I'm a huge fan of you too. Yeah, we should do that again. That was maybe three or so years ago now. We did some event and Paul's, he has this beautiful backyard here in Las Vegas and we did what did we call that? Something sounds. Uh, mm, Lutes and bang a gong, oh, <laughs> vinyasa, and let's see, sa sun salu sound and salutations. There Wasn't it is. It? There yeah. it is. Yeah. So we put that thing together and we had a bunch of yogis come over. We did some yoga outside. I think it wasn't too hot um, just yet, but it was in the summer. And then at the end, you're playing your gong. I'm like, who has a gong? <laughs> <laughs> It, it was a very cool collaboration. And I also really appreciate what you, what you just said a moment ago, how um, you recognize that I teach, I appreciate and value in my own practice more of the subtler things in yoga. The world of yoga is vast and su with, with such a breadth of types of practices to do. And yes, I love the more subtle things. I think there's even deeper transformational opportunities in the, in the subtler aspects, the breath, the contemplation, the nidra. Yes, of course, doing strong physical vinyasa practices are transformational in a sense as well, but that's on the physical level mostly. There's there's some other stuff, but I do appreciate the inner work. Yeah, 100%. Well, just from your bio, I don't think I realized you had two kind of start dates, something in 2001 and then again in 2008. So did you not really practice asana or physical practice for the first seven years? It was mainly meditation and writing that book. Can you walk us through that little moment? Very much so. I, I came to yoga through through the avenue of the subtler practices. Yeah, I didn't find a physical yoga class first like a lot of people do, and then subsequently finding the, the inner work. I found the inner work first. It was actually a Psy Seminars, if you've heard of it, I'm not sure, but that's a popular self-development organization that offers you know workshops for personal growth. So I was invited to one of those in 2001, and that was my first exposure to meditation. And then I dabbled in it for a few years, and, and then I stopped dabbling and dove headfirst in 2006 when I met my spiritual mentor, Terry, who is still to this day, we work like this uh, together. And he's the co-author of the book that, that we wrote together. When I met him in 2006, that's when I started diving into what is spiritual growth? What is consciousness? Is there a path and purpose? What is my life all about? And I absolutely loved it. And didn't do a single asana, hadn't done a single downward dog at that point. And I learned about meditation, learned about the techniques that I then realized were all yoga, you know, breathing, holding the breath a little bit, focusing on the spine, the heart, something. In 2008-ish, 9-ish is when I took a few physical yoga classes and realized, okay, now there's something to this as well. And it wasn't only until 2011 where I realized they really were two sides of the same coin. The physical practices address the physical body, but we are more than our physical bodies. Uh, I think most of your listeners will, will agree with that. And that's where the other techniques and the other paths, the more subtle practices come into play. So yes, short answer is yes. I was doing meditation long before I ever did a posture. Wow. Yeah. I love that. And it isn't the more common way that people come to yoga. So that's another thing that kind of makes you unique with also being an author. So cool. Uh, like what, how, 
what, how did you come to being like, I'm going to write a book? And how's that second book coming to be another voice that's adding to commentary on the Yoga Sutra, I think speaks to your level of understanding of some of these subtler concepts too. It, I'm so passionate about the philosophy of yoga because it's, it, it is practical. So the book happened, it, the book would not have happened if it weren't for Terry. Terry Hunt is, is as I mentioned, my, my spiritual uh, mentor and one of my best f friends on this, on, in this life. And he is about 30 five years older than I am. And so he has a lot more time on his hands. Our writing sessions were, we, we started, let's see, we, the book, we, we finished the book in 2012. And it was about two solid years of meeting and creating chapter concepts. And it wasn't a linear process. We created our chapter concepts um, and then expanded each chapter and then, and then decided where the chapters were going to go. So it's not a, a, a linear requirement for understanding the book. But the way it came, I, I guess I'm not starting from the beginning. You asked how that happened and then how the second book is happening. Well, I'll, I'll give a quick summary of, of how it happened because I love the story. And by the way, this is, uh, this is the book. It's, let's see, Ancient Wisdom for a New Age, a Practical Guide for Spiritual Growth. And it's, a, it's on Amazon. This is a soft one. We got hardcovers in the audio. Um, let's see, Kindle and Nook. I started recording an audio version with this equipment here during COVID. But then after COVID, after the world opened back up, I it became a lower priority. So the audio is not ready yet, but the book started based on Terry's and my joint teachings together. So I'll make the summary fairly quick. So when we met in 2006, I was introduced to, as you mentioned in my bio, the Theosophical Society, and uh, I'm still a member of the Theosophical Society today. Theosophy is a comparative study of science, religion, and philosophy. It's an open-minded inquiry into life and how it works. So comparing religions, comparing, contrasting, comparing philosophies, understanding philosophies, all different philosophies about life, and then science. What's up with this universe? What's up with like when the body dies? What happens? Is there some soul that like evaporates and goes up? like, so theosophy was super cool. Terry had, I thought for sure he had heard of my favorite author at the time, which was and is Eckhart Tolle, but Terry had not heard of Eckhart Tolle. What? So when I, yeah, and I was I was a little bit surprised because he was so well-rounded in his spiritual pursuits. I introduced him to Eckhart's second book, which is A New Earth. And to Terry and me now, we believe that that is one of the best modern day restatements of the Yoga Sutras. Not exactly word for word, but it drives to the core of what Patanjali teaches about self-transformation. And Eckhart Tolle gives us practical tips and tricks and guidelines on how to transform ourselves right now today. So when I showed that book to Terry, he said, wow, this is something we need to incorporate into our teachings. So the first time I taught anything spiritual related was in 2009, when Terry and I did a 10 month course on a basic theosophy book. It was a 10 chapter basic book on all the foundational concepts of spirituality that, that most of us would think of when we think of spiritual growth. So a chapter was on karma, for example. There's a chapter on reincarnation, a chapter on the power of the human mind. How powerful can our thoughts be? So that course that we started, te that we taught together in 2009, we decided to incorporate Eckhart Tolle's material as well. And that happened to be right when Oprah Winfrey had him on her, uh, he was in her book club and they were doing a webinar together. And we used some of the sessions from their webinar and our teaching as well. So that 10 month course finished and we realized, oh my gosh, this was good material where we combined Eckhart Tolle's work and we combined that with theosophy and the yoga sutras. It was so good. In fact, why don't we like write a book our own uh, on, of our own and combine these, these three amazing streams of wisdom and knowledge. So that's how the idea for our ancient wisdom book came together. It's a combination of our theosophical studies, the yoga sutras and Eckhart Tolle's modern day work on the ego because the ego might just be the biggest detriment towards enlightenment. Wow, that is so amazing. I have never heard of theosophy. Is that what it's called? Theosophy, yes. Theosophy. That is definitely, it explains a lot about you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that as a compliment because I'm kind of the same and I've, I'm a firm believer that 
in many ways, a lot of the spiritual teachings and traditions are saying the same thing, just using different words to describe to describe it. So I bet that that sort of comparing and contrasting of like how others are saying it is really fascinating. And I've never thought of a new earth, like just a mind blowing idea there. <laughs> and now I need to go back because I've read it before, but it's been many years. I need to go back and read it now with that um, perspective to see if I can see it. Cause that would be a really fascinating trip. I bet too. I, I love it so much. And you may have a different perspective on it when you do that. And I'd like to hear it, but I'm convinced and Terry's convinced that, that our emotional reactions to life and our, what Eckhart Tolle calls the pain body, our pain bodies and our egos are without question, in my opinion, the, the biggest, deter, the biggest roadblock towards our, our, eternal peace, our enlightenment, samadhi even, is the ego, is our emotional, our uncontrolled reactions that just close us off to spiritual, to the spiritual realms. It, it really, it really is. I love it. It's making me think of one thing though, that my teacher, it's probably a different topic, but maybe the, the conversation is the same in the sense that words like obstacles or enemies to our transformation or our ascendance you could look at them as those, you know, hindrances, but I like to think of things that are hindrances or enemies as kind of frenemies because they're still here for us in the sense that then we have a chance to participate in our own enlightenment because if it was already done for us, then you have no active engagement in your own evolution. So I know that's like a tangent. No, that's not a tangent. That's right in line. I agree a thousand percent. And my, the question bubbles up in my mind a lot when I was studying this for the first couple of times, if the ego and if the emotions and if whatever these roadblocks are, if they really are a, a challenge or something to work through or work around or beyond or overcome, why are they there in the first place? Did God, you know, mess up? Why? Do, but you what you just said is exactly right. We're a participant. We have, they're there for a reason. There are opportunities for us to learn. They're, they're opportunities for us to learn. And that's how we participate, as you just eloquently said, in our own advancement. We have to. We, there's no other way. It doesn't matter as much. It doesn't mean as much. If it was just done for us, we wouldn't care. But when you have the opportunity to get your own hands dirty, to work with it and to try, like have some, have some part of it, it means so much more. It does, and that's what's required. Uh, that is the way to do it, is to overcome it. No, no one can bestow enlightenment upon you. I mean, uh, if, if, if we do believe in, in wise, powerful gurus and teachers, they could give us help and they can give us energy and download some assistance to us, in, in a sense, but no, they, they can't do the work for us. I wanted to, to comment on something else that you said that was so, so helpful regarding the Theosophical Society, how part of its intention is to compare and contrast different traditions. You mentioned that it's important to see other perspectives and to see how someone else might be teaching it. Well, for your listeners, that's exactly appropriate for learning to be a better yoga teacher. If you teach something the same way every time, that's, you know, we should learn how to sit, teach things in different ways. Because what if your student base is different? What if you're teaching in a different city or a different country or teaching to a demographic that you hadn't before? And you need and you need to modify the way you're speaking and teaching. It might not land one way, and it might land beautifully another way. So this is a great trick for um, for your listeners. Yeah, so helpful. And I think that's hopefully why people find so much value in this podcast and these conversations is that we <laughs> we need to always keep growing, even beyond YTT. You know, and and. I want this podcast to feel like yoga teacher training sharing circles meets business school meets coffee chats with your other yoga teacher friends, you know, and, and to just have conversations with one another lights me up so much. And I get re-inspired hearing how you have found something that you find interesting. And now I'm like, oh gosh, I need to reread a new earth or I don't know. It just, it just psychs you up and gets you pumped again. And I feel the same way. The the white the two hundred hour YTTs are, are almost like the the very basic level training, not even really on the job training. They're basic pre you know pre job training, and then that's after you finish that, that's where the real learning um, 
really, really starts. I love that you're providing this platform for that. You, you asked about um, uh, progress on the new book too. Very, very little progress has been made, but it is, it is happening. And the, <laughs> The reason that we're choosing to do the Yoga Sutras as our second one is because Patanjali is brilliant, uh, was, I don't, I don't think he's still around, but he was, he was brilliant the way he laid out, you know, 196 sentences towards enlightenment. Like, here you go, memorize these, do these, work on these, and you'll, you'll be good. Here's like a manual for life. And it's ancient, right? You know, some, some scholars say he did that around, you know, 200 BC. Some say it was after Christ. Some say it was 10,000 BC. We don't know exactly when he was around, but it was ancient and we do things differently in 2024. And so I want to restate and explain some of those things in like modern day in my, uh, the, the way that we talk and speak in the yoga world today and make it more accessible. Yeah. And so many teachers would benefit from that because it is kind of sometimes like you're like, I know this is important, but it's still like going <laughs> going over my head. And so if it could be said in a way that's a little more relatable and accessible, then wow, just what what a gift to give to the yoga community. And, and you're, you're always in such service, but that, that would be amazing. I know though, writing a book is a huge feat. And the first one that you lifted up, it's like 400 pages, my brother. <laughs> it's a big thing. The font is kind of big and there are big margins. Um, it's <laughs> Don't try to downplay your success. I'm, I'm going to keep lifting you up. That's a really big accomplishment. I know it takes tons of work. Thank you so much. It's, it's not hard like people think. It's hard to write a book. It's not hard. It just requires a discipline. It requires a routine discipline to sit and do it on a regular basis. It's not hard, though. The hard part is discipline. If you think that's hard, then it is hard, I guess. Well, you are a very, very disciplined person, so that, that doesn't surprise me at all. I love helping yoga teachers stand out through skillful storytelling and theme weaving. That's why I'm so excited to tell you about Inspired Flow Monthly. Inspired Flow Monthly is the subscription that puts ready-to-go flows in your back pocket, so all you have to do is show up prepared and excited to teach yoga. Here's what you get each month one cohesive class plan PDF complete with dynamic sequences, curated playlists, one with lyrics and one without, and an inspiring theme for your next vinyasa yoga class. That's really what makes the subscription stand out. One ridiculously short and sweet video tutorial of the sequences, one subscriber email that gives you all the deets. Inspired Flow Monthly is for the yoga teachers that are experienced, but out of creative juice and need to gas up. Busy, yet passionate about delivering memorable vinyasa yoga classes. New, with a lack of confidence and an abundance of overwhelm. Needs help with understanding how to weave yoga philosophy without feeling super awkward, preachy, or random. Dislikes creating playlists and just wishes someone would do it for them. All about working smarter and not harder. Trust me, I get it. Teaching beyond the poses to the heart of yoga can be challenging. It's time consuming to find the right inspirational material. That's what makes Inspired Monthly so special. I've done all of the heavy lifting for you. I tell you exactly what to say and when to say it. So you show up prepared, polished, and relaxed. Inspired Flow Monthly is $27 a month or get two months free when you subscribe for the year. Head to inspiredflowmonthly.com to sign up or click the link in the show notes. Still not convinced? Try before you buy and snag one free sample delivered within seconds of signing up. Head to inspiredflowmonthly.com now or click the link in the show notes. See you inside. Okay, well, let's see. If we've talked about your book and this this next upcoming one, how I love how you keep saying like it's very practical. And I know that that's a big sort of thing for you is making these teachings really practical, making the subtle realms more accessible, kind of like what we were just talking. How how do you personally do that or these days right now, how is that appearing in your work as a teacher and how can you um, provide advice to other teachers out there listening to do so? Making physical yoga practical is is very easy and obvious. You know, you 
lift your arms up and you inhale. That's practical. You forward fold and exhale. That that is pretty obvious and practical. But as as you mentioned, of course, we're talking more about the subtle things. How do we make the philosophy of it practical, and how do I do that myself? That a lot of ways. Let let's boil it down to the very 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 most basic aspect of making something spiritual more practical, and that's um, I would say that that is getting our mind oriented to the to the subtle realms. How do you get your consciousness? I like to say uprooted from the physical world. Like if we're so rooted into the earth, into into materiality, into solidity, and we're so involved in how do I look today? How does my car look? How are people going to perceive my physical body today? Oh, did I mess that up? I'm nervous because that person, if we're so entrenched in that, trans, spiritual transformation will be very, very elusive, almost impossible. So get our, getting our mind uprooted from the physical world is the first is the first kind of step and in intention and the breath, the breath, the breath. I can just say meditation, but a lot of people will say, yeah, meditation's hard. I can't make my mind go blank. And I'm like, yo, that's not even what we're talking about. We don't want to make, a <laughs> we don't want to make our mind go blank. Rather, let's give your mind an anchor, give your mind something to focus on. Instead of thinking meditation is making your mind go blank and all of a sudden magically transcending in, with some being of light or something, Forget, forget all that. Let's make it practical and real world. Close your eyes for a second so you shut off your one of your sense windows to the outside world. So I would ask students to just do that at first. Let's get a little taste of this. So just close your, and you can do it right now if you'd like, and your listeners can do it right now. Just close your eyes. So you already started to uproot your awareness from the physical world. And then slowly breathe in through your nose. But while you breathe in through your nose, feel the air inside your nostrils. Like, how often do you do that? Now, when you breathe out, can you still feel the air inside your nostrils, like physically? And keep doing that. And then you're immediately brought into something more subtle than advertisements and fancy shoes and getting your car washed. And then once you're breathing through your nose and feeling the air, can you feel the air entering your body and making you feel better with each breath? And then maybe deepen the breath and expand your rib cage in the back and in the sides. And then once you do that a few times, you're going to realize there's more going on than just the physical, the physical realm. There's more happening in the world. So if your eyes are closed, go ahead, you can open them. And that is the very most basic, the most basic intention in making yoga philosophy practical. Let's start to get our minds reoriented to something more subtle, more. And then, of course, we can go deeper from there. We, we just talked about feeling better in the inner body. But of course, we've got emotions. We've got thought forms. We have intuitional bodies. We have other things, prana. I mean, so it can just go deeper from there. But yeah, get the mind calmer, get the mind a little uprooted. And then there's tons more from there. That is so good. Thank you so much just for that little mini experience. And that's exactly where I want us to go next because you have so much to offer with it. But I found that the word, I think people have such a mis, is it connotation or <clears throat> misunderstanding of the word meditation. And, and even the word meditation can be deceiving to people. And I actually prefer to swap it out for concentration don't even think meditation because people think the wrong thing. So instead, let's think concentrate on something. And that object, that object of concentration can be different for depending on which technique of meditation you're using. But the the point is to think of one thing again and again and again. And you probably know, I think it's from the Yoga Sutras, that imagery of like oil being poured out of a I always think of like an Aladdin, an Aladdin canister, oil being poured out. It seems it has the appearance of being still like watching oil being poured at a steady rate. It has the appearance of being still, but that oil is actually being poured out. It's continually moving, right? It's moving through. It's just the same thing over and over. And it's happening at a very um, regular rhythmic rate that it has the appearance only of being still, but it's still moving. And so it's like, that is what meditation is. It's not stopping though 
initially. Maybe you might get there like at some point where the awareness does absorb into itself. And that's like the deeper states of samadhi that's later explained. But for most population, they don't need to think about stopping or having no thought. We all need to think about having one thought again and again and again and again and again and expanding that capacity for concentration for longer and longer periods of time. That's it. You just nailed it. Exactly. It's training the, the brain first. Yeah, exactly. It's training the brain first and then the mind second. They're different things. The brain naturally neurons fire all the time and we're stimulated by thoughts and you know you see a squirrel squirrel something shiny go over here that's the opposite of what you just said what you just said is bringing again and again bringing your mind back to whatever you chose to be your anchor thought and i love that analogy of the oil that's actually i that must be from a commentary on the sutras because the way that thought forms work there becomes a stream of consciousness towards the object so it is a stream and it is a very smooth and subtle, well, eventually it will be stream towards the object and then back from the object. It's like both directions. You start to get insights into what you're meditating on and that's approaching samadhi where you're merging with the object because you're so still for an extended period of time, you start to receive the stream coming right back. You send your thoughts there and then you do receive. And I love that. That's what it is. When your mind wanders, when something chimes or dings or someone sneezes, just bring your mind right back, bring it back again, bring it back again. And incidentally, what Eckhart Tolle says is that not only does that help you truly meditate eventually and transcend thoughts, but it also reduces our pain and suffering. Really, it does. Wow. Okay. So that's what he means by like the pain body. Is that, I guess, his way of saying like misidentification of ego? Like, well, ego really is misidentification of our awareness. Like, thinking we're something that we're not but what is you have to remind me because it's been so long but is that what he's saying it's even more simple than that he does say that but it's even more simple it's you're in the present moment his first book was called the power of now okay, the power of, and keeping your mind on one thought you're present you're not worrisome about yesterday what you didn't get accomplished you're not regretful and you're not anxious about tomorrow you're present. He, he, he gives us this really, really interesting contemplation. He says, actually, did he say that? Or did, I don't know where I got this, but think about where suffering exists and can suffering actually exist in the present moment? Suffering, not physical pain. Suffering relates to past and future. Yeah, no, I can't. Wow. This is so good. And what's also crazy is when you describe this effort that it takes to stay at the center of now and presence, it can sound like it's hard or like it takes effort. But what's interesting is that doing what we do of thinking of the past, thinking of the future, all of that is also takes a ton of energy and is really hard and is really why all of us are so tired all the time, especially like mental, we, we exude so much mental energy on just this like constant, incessant thought and worry of past or future. It's such a waste. My goodness. Yes. And that it's, it can at first take effort to keep your mind on the present moment and the power of now in effect, it, it's almost, it's almost like actually a rest for the mind to be still. So many mic drop moments in this session. Mic drop again. We're done. Turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> you, you just gave me a nugget. Like the, It takes effort at first to stay still, but it takes more effort to anguish over the past and be anxious over the future. It's a respite for the tumultuous nature of the spinning thoughts. The rotation of the thoughts, I say it's like rotating down a toilet. When we ruminate over something that we're worried about, that takes way more effort than focusing on your heart chakra. Let's just... <laughs> yes. Way to bring it back to that whirlpool. I mean, that's like Yoga Sutra 1.2 right there. Is that it? I've never imagined it like the toilet flushing. My, <laughs> my energy down. That's my energy going down the toilet. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Thank goodness for you. I mean, just thank goodness for these practices. Yes. Agreed. Okay. Wow. I can't wait to reread some of these Eckhart Tolle books because I, I, I mean, you and I, of course, would do this. I have a problem where I make everything about yoga <laughs> or I'll be like, oh yeah, like yoga says that, you know, in, in a certain way. But 
I never, I guess I, I loved the book and I knew that there was a lot of like spiritual teaching in it, but I didn't see it. I didn't see it that way. So I'm excited to go back and look at it now. Let's do another episode and dive into some of the different concepts in the book. Yeah, <laughs> let's do it. I'm down. <laughs> okay. So with your clarity, you have this really incredible um, workshop, don't you? On like helping, helping. It's what you do. You're retreating Costa Rica. It's all on clarity, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, clear. This idea of clear vision is is prominent in everything that I teach. Being able to see clearly, and what we mean by that is, again, the ego confuses what's important. We sometimes think getting a six pack is more important than anything, but I mean, let's be honest. Physical health is important, but there's more to life than just getting your body ripped, and being able to see that clearly is is helpful. <laughs> and seeing your life clearly can also help you with, oh, should I take this new job or should I stay in the current one that I'm not that happy in? Do I need to be happy single or do I need to find a partner immediately? These kinds of things that are wants and needs and ego sometimes dictates, but was it our higher mind or was it our ego? And being able to see these things from our higher mind's perspective that's what clarity is. And that's what the Clarity Workshop aims to do. Wow. In 2020, I think it was 2020, maybe it was 2021. That was my word of the year was clarity. And I strove all that year to just get clarity because it can be so frustrating when you feel like you're like, I have no idea right now. <laughs> I have no clarity about life. And before you divulge into what clarity is, I just want to, I guess, offer encouragement for either teachers or just listeners that sometimes though, the path to clarity is confusion. And confusion or cloudiness is part of the process, as I'm sure you'll probably talk about on the way to clarity. And I guess that's all, that's all I have to say there. <laughs> I love it though. Yeah, the, the only way out is through. I've, I've heard it said that way as well. And the only way to overcome, you know, ego and nasty emotions is to experience them and learn about them and then learn what happened, why they're there and then work. You can't avoid it. So yeah, you got to go through. Yeah. Yeah. Confusion. It's darkest before the morning, before light, you know, confusion, it has to be there. And so you can know you're confused. Yeah. And that it's just as valuable of a lesson to learn what doesn't work and what you don't like as it is to learn what does work and what you do like, like it all, it all fits. So walk us through, give us like a um, real time experience of this, this little mini workshop, and maybe it can give some clarity to some of the, the teachers. Before we walk through the, the practical portions of it, the, the, the actual work of it, I want to share what it actually is, what the workshop is. It's based on this book, which is called The Four Desires by a different guy named Rod Stryker. Many of you have probably heard of him. Um, I've been, I've trained with him since 2014. He's a yoga teacher here in America. He also travels internationally. And one of, one of his offerings is called The Four Desires workshop uh, training. And I've participated in that many times as a student, and I've also trained to be a Four Desires trainer with him. And I've assisted him in his big ones that he does. And many times I've gone through the process myself. And so it's called the Four Desires Training. And there's a book, of course, which I just showed. And there's also a workbook. The workshop that I lead is not called the Four Desires because I add a lot of different things in and modify a few things. And I do it my way. So it's not uh, word for word his way, but he's brilliant and created a really effective process that I use most of. And I incorporate other things as well, like the Yoga Sutras, Theosophy, Eckhart Tolle, different, different things. So people that have trained to teach the Four Desires Workshop um, do it maybe similarly to the way I do, but it's not exactly the same. And uh, it's in different formats as well. So the, the format that I, that I present this workshop in is usually a six or seven session series of about two hours each two hours each, six or seven times. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Um, the way that it's originally done from him, it was five days. You go, it's like a retreat. You go for five days and you do the work in five days. Some teachers do it in three days. I've done it as a weekend workshop, like a Friday evening, six hours Saturday and six hours Sunday. And by the, by, by Sunday's end, um, 
we have a Dharma code and a Sankalpa and a Vikalpa. I'll explain what all those yes. things are. So yes, yes. Now, now let's 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 get a sample of it. So, Mackenzie, do you want to sign up for the Clarity Workshop right now? It's happening in like fifteen seconds. You ready? I would love to. <laughs> Amazing. So it's uh, our first session of the Clarity Workshop, and I want you to know that by the time we're done, you're going to have a, a a written roadmap of how to steer your life after you leave this workshop. And I don't mean, I don't say that lightly. I say, literally, you're going to have a written statement that will tell you how to respond to decisions that you might need to make at work tomorrow. When you're confronted with a challenge, you're going to be able to look at that Dharma code, we call it, and it will remind you of how to respond and which choice to, to take. I hope that sounds cool because I think it's cool. Oh, it's so amazing and so needed. Everybody needs a little touchstone. Yeah, for sure. So, the Dharma code that I've mentioned a couple of times is a statement of your, of your life's mission in this body. Since this, since this philosophy does uphold the concept that reincarnation is real. Now you don't have to believe in reincarnation to get a lot out of this workshop. And however, please, please know that in yoga philosophy, the soul does not die when your physical body dies and the soul does come back to earth and occupies a new physical form in order to have different experiences because Mackenzie can't have the same experiences that Paul has since we have different anatomy, we have different skin tones, we have different proclivities, we speak differently. So that's the, the underlying philosophy. So in this life, your body is going to experience or have the opportunity to experience certain things. So let's figure out how to create, how to start crafting this Dharma code. We're going to do four, four exercises and they're writing exercises. So get your pen and paper out. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to do something called a thriving moment poem, a poem. You didn't know you're a poet, right? You're we're all poets. Now this may seem a little bit uncomfortable. I understand. And it doesn't have to rhyme, but we are going to write something down and what it's going to be. Let, let's actually go into just a, a very short contemplation before we, we do our, we do our writing. So just close your eyes again and relax your, face and relax your jaw and take a slow inhale through your nose and remember how we felt the air inside the nostrils earlier just feel that again for a moment All right now before we write this this poem and again it does not have to rhyme and there's no form or guidelines i want us to think about a time so i'd like you to just go back in time in your mind to when you were at your maximum mckenzie to the max we call it a thriving moment. Now, it might not be one minute. It might have been a day, a week. It might have been a period of a month or a year of your life where you were thriving in the best way. There's a caveat, though. This time that we're identifying is not a time when everything was perfect. This moment that we're going to write about is a time that you overcame something tough and you achieve something great in spite of being really challenged. And after it was over, you have a great accomplishment that you would not have been able to achieve if you weren't thriving. So we all have a, a time or two or three or five like this. So let's just remember a time we can identify when we were at our max. And then let's open our eyes and we're gonna write about it. All right, so that's, that's one exercise now. So you've got your poem. Now let's look at a couple other things. We're going to now <laughs> do another meditation and contemplate four people who we admire in life. And they're going to show up to your 80th birthday party. So you're 80 now. And you're still thriving, by the way. Like you accomplished, like you did your Dharma to, to the max. Okay. And your friends are there. You got 150 people at your 80th birthday party. And four, four special people are going to stand up and give glowing testimonials of how you achieved so much. And you're going to write their testimonials in their voice. Now, the reason why there are four is because the ancient teaching of Purushartha from the Vedas talks about how the soul comes into the physical world and occupies a body for a period of time. And there are four actual intentions that need to be fulfilled for the soul's mission to be accomplished. The teaching is called Purushartha, the needs or desires of the soul. And the four desires are the longing for purpose is one. We all want to have some purpose. We all don't like to have just no direction in life. 
purpose. Everyone needs to have health and safety and basic needs met. That's one. So basic needs, like the bottom level of Maslow's hierarchy. We all need a little bit of fun and pleasure and enjoyment. Could be romance, could be beauty, could be art. We all need to fulfill a little bit of play in our lives. And this ancient teaching of Purushartha says that the soul also needs to have some kind of spiritual fulfillment, whether it's church, whether it's Red Rock Canyon, whether it's meditation practice, whether it's a spiritual tradition. So these are the four desires. And when your testimonials are being given at your 80th birthday party, each person is going to speak about your amazing accomplishments in your life in the category of each desire. So how you nailed it with living your purpose, how you nailed it with taking care of you and your family's basic needs. You had enough income for food. You had enough shelter. You had enough means to achieve anything else that you desire. You had enough fun and enjoyment and family time and play time. And then you had a spiritual connection. So each person is going to talk. So we're going to do this exercise. And then there are two more. We don't have time to go into the other two, but those are the two out of the four exercises that we'll do to start crafting your life's mission statement, which we call a Dharma code. But wait, so the Dharma code is only one of six touch points at the end of the clarity workshop. So the Dharma code is only one thing. We need to talk about Sankalpa, Vikalpa, departure point. The Dharma code is, is a biggie. It's amazing. Like having a mission statement of your life is the big, is the big nugget that we leave the workshop with. But that one is actually not the most practical thing that we're going to leave with. Let's take our life's mission and look at the next six to 12 months. So if, if we're going to live our life's mission, we need to set some intermediary goals too. Like let's be realistic and practical. So next week when I, so when the workshop is over and we go back to the real world and we have to go to our job, the rubber's about to hit the road. So we need to, something else to guide us. And the something else that's going to guide us right now is called a sankalpa, which is, which means a vow, a commitment of your highest, of the highest order. It's a vow, something that's tangible. Now, this one is going to be very specific and quantifiable in time, time and, and measurement. So it's a goal. It's a goal that we're going to be able to physically achieve and measure that we can do in six to 12 months. Let's recall the four desires. So the four desires are the longing to know your purpose the longing for physical needs and basic needs to be met. That's the second one. The comma, K-A-M-A is pleasure, enjoyment, fun. And then moksha relates to spiritual freedom and connection to something greater. So those are the four desires. I'd like you to just identify which one needs the most work right now. We all have one or two or three or four <laughs> that need work, but which one of those four needs the most work? Oh, it's Artha. Okay, great. So open your eyes. And I, I'm just making that up. Just Ar <laughs> So now we'll, we'll do a mind map. So let's on your piece of paper, write Artha, which means basic needs, A-R-T-H-A. -A. So just write that on a blank piece of paper, then circle it. Now, Artha means that your physical needs, your basic needs in life are, are handled. There's no money concerns. You have steady income. You have steady food on the table, health is going well for family, your health routines are just fine. You're, we're, we're imagining that and then start doing a mind map. So draw a line outside of that circle of Artha and put down a word that relates to you having that fulfilled. So I just, I kind of did a sample one. I said, you're healthy, you've got food on the table, but write down what it means to you. So for example, family dinner every night, family dinner every night means Artha is fulfilled. Mortgage payment is paid early every month. Mortgage payment early. New car. Anything like that. So we do a mind map of 10 to 12 things that relate to what it looks like in your life if that desire is fulfilled. And then we start to craft a tangible goal to help us get that. And there are a couple other steps that I'm skipping, but generally speaking, that's going to help us arrive at and by this point, most people already know what it is that they, that they need to focus on. I need to get out of this job. I need to get a new job. I need to create this, this online program that Mackenzie and I have been talking about for so long and sell it and have passive income from our yoga teaching career. Like that's one of my, one of my recent ones. Um, so the Sankalpa is the uh, intermediary goal that supports your, your Dharmic mission statement, your, your Dharma code. 
I know you probably feel like crazy because you do this usually like much longer, but it's really cool to feel and experience the crash course. So keep going. Oh, oh, for sure. I mean, that's why it takes seven sessions of two hours each. So it's 14 hours of doing this stuff. Yeah. So the Dharma Code and Sankalpa are the two biggies. There's a third biggie, and this one is called the V Kalpa. So for any of your listeners who like to nerd out about yoga philosophy and Sanskrit, there's a prefix of V that can go before a word, which means separating. So San usually means to connect or relating to the highest V, like V yoga is to separate. So the, the prefix V, excuse me, means to disconnect. So what's a V Kalpa? If a San Kalpa connects us to our soul's intention, a V Kalpa separates us. And this is the part of the experience that is not fun, but is the most revealing. And this is the part that takes us into the depths of our destructive nature. We all have a little bit of it. Some of us have a lot of destructive nature. And the way we figure out our V Kalpa is again, a writing exercise. We are going to go back to that same desire that we used for the Sun Kalpa, the desire that we identified that needs the most work. I was thinking fun and pleasure. Let's do, let's do Kama. So I think we've all heard of the Kama Sutra, right? Kama Sutra that relates to the, the, the teachings on pleasure. Well, the word Kama doesn't only mean just pleasure. It also means fun. So let, let's, let's say that that was the category of desire that, that we need to work on. So to come up with our Vikalpa, which is the part of us, our, the part of our nature that undermines us and that causes us to not achieve goals that we think we really do need. And it's almost like an unconscious thing. There are several exercises. The big, the big one is our eulogy and we will write our own eulogy in the voice of, of somebody else again kind of how we did the, the testimonials at your 80th birthday party the, di the main difference other than the fact that you're dead at a eulogy is that you die right now and your, your life is over now like literally now so whenever you do this exercise you're now dead so you cannot do anything in life you cannot finish a project that you started i can't finish my yoga sutras book because i started it and procrastinated and didn't I can't go make amends with several loved ones who I've been meaning to, but pushed it off. I, ha I, I can't start the, pro you, you can't start a project you've always been wanting to because time, it, you know, tomorrow never comes. So you're dead and someone that loves you, someone that knows you is going to give a eulogy about you. And they're going to be very honest about things that you did do, but also all the things you didn't do. And they're going to be loving and caring. And, and this is coming for, through your hand, like you're, going to write in how you think they would speak about you, but you're going to do the writing and it'll be very telling because they might be more honest than you would ever be about yourself if you're just writing it on your own. And once you finish your eulogy and you have a very honest look at all the things that you thought that you wanted to do that you'd get around to someday, but you didn't, there'll be a lot of clues in there as to why as well. There'll be clues. And then after you, after we write it, there are several things we do to extract ideas as to why we procrastinate, why we don't do things, why. And we use that to find out what our Vikalpa is, what our underlying desire is that is counter to what we think we want. We all think we want to be motivated every day, sit down, do this and work, but there's something else we want too. We want comfort. We want to prove someone wrong. We want to avenge. And this is stuff that we don't want to admit but it's there or else everybody would, uh, would achieve everything that they ever wanted to achieve. Right. And so this part is the biggest, most magnifying mirror, right. To see all the pores, like right in there see all the pores. Oh, I don't like that one. I'm not going to look at that, but you need to, you better look at it. <laughs> so that's the V Kalpa. So we've got Dharma code, Sankalpa, V Kalpa. Let's talk about one more big nugget that we walk away from the workshop with, and it's called the departure point exercise. Patanjali talks about the concept of willpower and developing willpower, and you can refer to it as tapas, you can refer to it as discipline, as a lot of things. Um, when you start doing a discipline in life and when you get your consciousness in the habit of routines and you start turning the big wheel of momentum on anything in your life, it gets easier to turn the wheel. Momentum starts going on. It's momentum assists the, the forward movement. So the departure point exercise helps us to make a little change, which then is that, that nudging forward of the big wheel of momentum to make bigger change. And what the, what we're going to change is something that's not terribly destructive in our lives, but something that wastes time or wastes energy. 
And so we think about our day, we think about all the things we naturally do, normally do, habitually do, and we'll identify a list of things that we just do on a routinely basis. And they can be helpful, not helpful to our spiritual growth. If I have a tendency to always grab a bag of chips when I come home and sit down for a few minutes and eat chips, that's maybe they're healthy chips. Maybe it's avocado oil that they're fried in. Maybe it's, but, but, but yet it's a routine that may not be the best. Um, there can be more destructive things like smoking a cigarette. Maybe we, maybe, maybe we do that. Maybe we smoke weed. Maybe we want to stop that. Maybe we have two glasses of wine every night. We want to have one or something. So it's something that's not terrible, but something that you might want to change and we'll identify that and then make a commitment to doing something else. And then the departure point technique is committing for 40 days that when you have the desire back in your life, when you have the desire or the, th the first thought to do the habit that's less than, than constructive, don't tell yourself you can't do it. That's not what we're doing. We're just going to pause for a second before you reach for the chocolate cake every night before bed or whatever, whatever it is. Just stop for a second. Just stop and don't do it mindlessly. Take a few breaths, close the eyes. You can even be standing at the refrigerator if it's the cake thing. You can, but just stop, just don't do it mindlessly. Take a few breaths, just center yourself, get, get present in the moment and repeat your Dharma code, repeat your Dharma code to yourself a few times, remind yourself of your mission that your soul is relying on you to do, to accomplish. Just remind yourself of the Dharma code. That's it. Do it a few times in your head. And then when you open your eyes, reach for the cake, eat it, love it, or don't, doesn't matter. As long as you did it with presence and you didn't do it like a zombie. And then something will change. If you commit to doing that process, something will change. And that, that'll that be the, the, the start of the big wheel of making bigger changes. Wow, this is so good. And I know you probably feel like you're like, ah, how do I tell everybody about this in such a short amount of time? But what I really hope that listeners and teachers out there are gleaning from what you're saying is to think outside of the box of what type of workshops you can create and the types of topics that you can teach on. Because again, the stuff that you're teaching in this is so practical and so tangible and equips them with real life instances that they can apply yoga, which is creating a little bit more spaciousness in their day versus that stimulus and their response. Very well said. Yes. Speaking to your yoga teacher listeners. Yes. If you're going to offer a workshop, of course you can do a hip opening workshop or a, you know, a yin workshop. Of course you can give people something that's a little bit practical as well with their rest of their life. Because you know, the concept of taking yoga off the mat, figure out a way to, to do that in the hip opening workshop that you're doing, or, or make it all about the yoga off the mat. Like this clarity workshop is there's nothing about asana anywhere in this workshop, not a single thing. Because yoga is so much more than your hamstrings. Mm -hmm. And is that the feedback that you hear? I mean, I can imagine people being like, I had no idea that like, like how much yoga philosophy concepts, even with words like sankalpa, vikalpa, dharma, like how it can actually be applied in these like everyday choices and how it can help them live this more aligned life. I mean, is that the things that you hear from people? I bet. Y yes, yes, it is. And it's, I also hear it when, when people don't respond to it because most of the world does think of, most of the Western world, I'll, I'll say, does think of yoga as physical movements to get flexible. And yes, I do get feedback from yogis that say, wow, I didn't realize, but I also, I want to reach a lot of my friends and my spheres of influence who aren't already in yoga studios all the time doing classes. And it's challenging. It's challenging to share with them that yoga is more than downward dog, yeah. but it can really change your life. And it, and it doesn't mean that you have to, you can't be a religious person. I also like to say that yoga philosophy com can complement a religion. If you're a devout, anything, a devout religion, religionist. Yeah, absolutely. That it's a, I can't remember where I heard this phrase, but it was something about like, it's a optimization system oh, that like, Jesus. it just basically like optimizes what is your propensity or like your preference. And I was like, that's such a good way of thinking of it that you can be like atheist and it just makes you more atheist, like a better atheist. That's such a good way to, that, that's almost verbatim what theosophy talks about. Theosophy 
offers don't leave your religion to become a theosophist or to join the society or to study theosophy rather live your religion deeper live it deeper optimize your belief structure if you choose to change it of course you can but there's no requirement to do that wow well paul thank you so much for giving us a peek behind that clarity workshop and i hope that it's gotten some of the yoga teachers listening their wheels turning and just getting excited of how like how creative you can get in the way that you share and to also not be afraid to make it not about the physicality and to do different types of exercises like your eulogy writing these journal prompts these visualizations these other other type of experiences to to get to the same aim you know not just like you're saying a forward fold or a hip opening workshop or infuse it in that and that there's so many, so many ways that we could do it. So I think that that's really, really cool. I can't wait to experience. I want to like come to the whole thing and it not feel so, you know, like you're just giving me the crash course, but to experience it, because I bet it's so helpful to walk away with those tangible Dharma statements, the song call, like all of that, that must be really powerful. Yes. Yes. Oh, it is so powerful. Yes. If I would love for you to come, that would be an honor. <laughs> it would be amazing. So you have one. It's coming up in July, right? And then on another St. George yoga retreat in August, Costa Rica in 2025. Can you tell the listeners just all the incredible stuff that you've got coming up and how they can get plugged in? Thank you for the opportunity. Yes, I, I, I would love to. Um, on the website, newrajayoga.com, I, I have all the upcoming offerings. The, the Clarity Workshop is, is going to happen. I like to do it twice a year. I, I hold it around... January for it's great for New Year's resolution type of type of work. And I like to do it again mid year for a mid year check in a, a, a recalibration of your trajectory, if you will. So um, late July, that's um, July 28th. So it'll be Sundays and Mondays, seven sessions. Uh, the Sunday sessions are one to 3pm. And then the Monday sessions are 530 to 730 p.m. So Sunday and Monday, seven sessions. And I, I hold them at my home studio here at the house in uh, near Lake Mead in 215 in the west part of the valley. Also live stream. So everything I do is always live streamed as well and recorded. So if you can't make the live version of either in person or on the stream, you can watch the video and do the work the same way. So that is coming up. I would be honored uh, to have you experience it with me. And then the next event after that will be the retreat in St. George that I'm leading with Gabby Aguilar, and we are going to a resort called the Red Mountain Resort, which is gorgeous. I like to call it a mini Sedona. It's a little bit closer, a little bit cheaper, a little bit smaller than Sedona, but it's gorgeous red rocks. And we have a three night all inclusive yoga retreat there, August 22nd for three nights. Amazing. I need to learn more about this like mini Sedona place. Yeah. St. George, it's two hours away. Cool, cool. Well, thank you again, Paul, for being here. I appreciate your time and for sharing your wisdom. And thank you to all the listeners. Keep coming back every Wednesday for your dose of actionable wisdom. And until then, namaste, blessed. Thanks for listening. If this is your first time, peruse our feed to see if there's something else that will serve you. We're so grateful that you're here and invite you to join our inner circle by subscribing to our newsletter. If this episode resonated with you, help us spread the word by sending it to a friend who needs to hear this message. Likes, follows, sends, shares, and reviews help us to continue delivering high quality content to you for free each and every week. Don't forget to tag at master your yoga teaching so we can reshare. I am a certified yogi. However, this podcast is intended for information and entertainment only. If you are interested in mentorship or coaching with me, check out the website linked in the show notes to get more information. This content and other content produced by CLW Studios and affiliated partners is not therapy, and nothing in this content indicates a therapeutic relationship. Any opinions of guests on the podcast are their own and do not represent the opinions of Mackenzie or CLW Studios. Learn more about Mackenzie, her guests, and CLW Studios by following the links in the show notes. Keep shining and we will see you next Wednesday for another dose of Master Your Yoga Teaching. Namaste blessed.